Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. And I uh, hope you're all enjoying your, your drinks. I hope you'll agree this has been our best conference yet. Um, each year it gets bigger. I think we've got about a third more people than we had last year. And last year we had a third more people than the year before. And um, that's a reflection of something. I'm not sure what, but, uh, but we're very happy to have so many MGOs, so many suppliers and so many insurers here. Firstly, I'd like to thank everybody involved, the panel members and chairs, the keynote speakers, obviously, but in particular at this point, the staff at the MGAA, um, Teresa, Jane, Paula, and Maria, who've worked tirelessly to make this happen and run so smoothly. It absolutely would not happen without them. And I'd also like to thank everyone here at the Hilton Bankside. Um, it's easy to take them for granted, um, but we absolutely couldn't do it without them. You couldn't hear me without them, for example. Now for our closing speaker, Robert Hiscox. Um, now, firstly, Robert is a serious art collector, and anyone who's been to the Hiscox offices will know that. And um, I, I certainly, when I was a young broker, used to be quite impressed with some of the stuff and quite unimpressed with others. But uh, <laughs> Since retirement, he's devoted his time to charitable endeavours and trying to make money farming, or as he says, trying to lose less money. Now, Robert Hiscox started his insurance career as a fine art and PA underwriter at Roberts and Hiscox in 1965 and spent 50 years building a small Lloyds managing agency into an international insurance business, interrupted, as he says, ever so slightly by reconstruction and renewal at Lloyds when he was deputy chairman, I think. He contributed massively to saving the market, and that actually is no understatement. Um, I remember when I'd had a very minor modicum of success at my, the broking company I worked for back in the 80s, um, the, the guy in charge called me in and said to me, Charles, as you've done so well, um, we're going to help you become a name at Lloyd's. Um, that cost me about 50,000 quid. That <laughs> and I was lucky. And the thing is that 50,000 pounds is, is an awful lot of money when you haven't got it. And that was the problem with working names, I think. Um, and at that time, it was very nearly an existential thing. And those of us that were around at Lloyd's at the time uh, remember it very well. And there were a, a small number of people that contributed massively to getting Lloyd's back from the brink. And Robert Hiscox was one of them. And possibly his biggest contribution in doing so um, was restructuring in the restructuring of Lloyd's capital base and the development of corporate capital. And he couldn't quite understand why the, the market after 300 years was still completely um, based on private individuals pledging their last cufflink or whatever they used to call it, um, when there's an awful lot of capital out there that would invest in Lloyd's corporately and with limited liability. He also contributed, contributed to the introduction of capacity auctions, which means that getting in and out um, and cashing in and out, if you like, is something that, that or being on a valuable syndicate, you can, um, you can cash in some of that value. And more recently, Robert was awarded the gold medal for services to Lloyds in 2013, which, in my view, was very, very well deserved. He probably doesn't need more of an introduction. We all know who he is. We all know that he talks straight and says what he thinks, which is a great quality in my book, but not always easy for the powers that be to hear. Um, I'm looking forward to what he has to say, so over to Robert Hiscox. Well, this is a challenge. I've uh, been retired for five years. I'm 75, and I retired at 70, which is quite old enough. So Charles somehow dug me out of my... got me off the tractor... <laughs> And persuaded how he did it, you know, he's got such a silken tongue, how he persuaded me to come and uh, do this, and I've, I've lost a lot of sleep over it, because, um, you know, why on earth he asked me, I don't know, but why on earth I accepted. 
Except for... I turned to him and I said, uh, well, there's £500 to the charity of my choice. He said, fine. Oh, shit, should have been 5000 I never was a good negotiator, I really... I, I'm like Theresa May. I couldn't negotiate my way out of a paper bag. Um, anyway, I did tell him that I was only fit to do a trip down memory lane, which he fortunately has sort of done an introduction so that I can go in that direction, because um, I was in the Royal Academy this morning looking at pictures and... Uh, I looked down on my phone and see where I was supposed to be later today, and I saw that your conference was called The Future of Insurance. Now, you know, so I, well, you've had enough future now. You're all blinded by the future. <laughs> but it's always useful to talk about the past, as, um, you know, you must... What's, what's the famous phrase? If you don't pay attention to it, you, you live to repeat it, and all mistakes will be repeated. I, I was amazed. I came in and listened to The Future of Lloyd's brilliant... Uh, panel debate and I actually heard you know about wholesale brokers retail broker wholesale broker MGA MGA this then on the, and somebody at the end of the chain they said that's actually called an insurance company the man at the end of the chain but I thought uh, have we changed you know in the, in the 50 years I've been there anyway I was going to call my talk when I was going to talk about MGAs the, the dilemma because uh, I ask people about MGAs at work and around. I don't come to EC3 very often or go to EC3. But um, they're either, you know, as you would all believe you are and should be, the creative arm, the distribution arm, and the salvation of the insurance industry, who are all so dull they needed you to do their basic job for them, or you're the devil incarnate because you undermine rating and discipline. and you, uh, And I can't decide which you are. <laughs> and uh, I'm not going to solve that for you, but I'm going to go into the history a bit, because as Charles said, I, I did have a wonderful career, and I also listened to this debate about how dull insurance was perceived to be and how nobody ever wanted to go to insurance. And uh, I know if you say when you're young you're in insurance, it doesn't go down too well if you're trying to have your way with... <laughs> I'm not allowed to do that. You're not allowed to do that anymore, are you? God, you poor young things. But um, I was once talking to a, a major celebrity, and they were, we were getting on freshly well, and I'd asked them about them, which they talked about. And in the end, they said, turned to me and said, what do you do? And I said, I'm a bookmaker. Oh, fascinating. They said, absolutely fascinating. Tell me about that. You know, I said, well, actually, I'm an underwriter you know, of insurance. Walked away. <laughs> And that's what's so funny that, that people think insurance is boring because it is bookmaking precisely. I sat in a box and I only thought of myself as a bookmaker. They're all betting their house is going to burn and I'm betting it won't. You have to write a balanced book and get the right price. And, but um, that's what we do and we take the risk out of, as they were saying, we take the risk out of everything everybody does and nobody could get out of bed in the morning without insurance, but we are deemed to be dull. Um, I, I think it has improved a lot, actually, because I, I, I have young, so I've got five children, and the, you know, insurance is not deemed to be that dull anymore. Than, I think it was in my day, because the insurance companies sat with boring people with a rating schedule. I mean, when I started, there was a tariff. All the major insurance companies were tariff companies, and they, had a, they published their rates. I mean, it was page three, up, down, uh, the price is, and it really was a very dull occupation. Lloyd's was, of course, never like that. I mean, Lloyd's was always... Out and out bookmaking. Um, so I've, I've had a most wonderful career because we, when we started, there was absolutely no rules, no regulations. You young won't know what it was like. It was like the Wild West. It was fantastic. <laughs> you know, I sat at a box, and you know, the, the, the only discipline in Lloyd's was a word from the chair. And I remember Peter Miller calling me out once and saying, I must stop doing something I was doing, which I knew was perfectly legal, sensible, but it just wasn't the Lloyd's way. And I said, oh, oh, uh, Mr. Chairman, that'd be very interesting. The Daily Mail would very like to hear you're making this sort of threat and telling me to stop doing this. He said, you can't talk to the press, which was a widely, not written down, but there was a widely code of conduct. You never spoke to the press. And I said, oh, to turn, ch tell me, Chairman, which bylaw says I can't talk to the press? Get out, he said. <laughs> and I, I was always a very, a very difficult officer, but... Um, the wonderful thing about that uh, time was the lack of regulation and the lack of everything was that, um, you know, you could just create and innovate. And I do feel terribly sorry for the current generation when they, you know, if you're going to 
write a risk, you're going to say why you wrote the risk, you're going to justify it, and if you haven't written the risk, you'll say why you haven't written the risk, and it's just, I mean, one of the reasons I really was keen to retire was um, regulation. I mean, the things that really got me were regulation stifling us. I think you MGAs, if you're all MGAs, are much less lightly regulated than we are, all the insurance companies are, but it was absolutely mind-blowing to have these young people turning up, telling us how to run our business and reading our minutes and looking at how it was done. And I, on my way out, I had some real swings at the uh, regulator. Hector Sands, I nearly reduced to tears, but silly man. And, um, but that and political correctness goes without saying. It's very difficult for a man like me. Health and safety and corporate governance. I mean, you, if you're on a board of a decent-sized company, corporate governance is, is 95% of what a board does is, you know, risk committees, audit committees, everything to, to make sure that we're all ticking every box that we're running this company out. Nobody's talking about winning more business or underwriting, but there you are. And people always want to join main boards, and I always tell them, don't. It's incredibly boring. <laughs> uh, I joined... I also like to say that in 50 years, we never made a decision at a board meeting. Everybody wants to be on the board because they think that's where debate takes place and decisions are made. No, executives make decisions. Executives decide what to do, and they go and nurse the board through it. <laughs> when I retired, the regulator did one of them and said, said to me, would you come and uh, be on a committee which, which uh, whatever it is, past task force, looking at what is reasonable to expect from a non-executive director? And I said, I'd love to because it's unreasonable what they're expected to do at the moment, especially when you've been through Solvency 2 and they all expect to know every single detail of, of that. Uh, I'm, I'm going to gossip a bit because I'll, I'll stop when I, my time's up, but I won't have got anyway because I, 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 when I start... What? <laughs> I, w I went down to see Hector Sands and, um, and I said uh, that regulation and Solvency 2 was absolutely strangling us and we'd lost two good non-executive directors who were not prepared to be asked by junior people in the FCA or whatever it was on their knowledge of, of this complicated uh, act which had come out of Europe and we'd embellished no end. Um, and I, I had a great watch of all the directors that had come out and I plumped him on his desk in Docklands and I said, that's our, what our non-executive directors are supposed to know all about. He said, I think so too. So I said, right. There's a test paper for you. And he, and he looked and he said, well, they, they, they shouldn't have to answer this sort of question. I said, for God's sake, that's what your little people are coming into, asking senior non-execs if they know exactly what the page 37 and the something risk analysis. And he didn't have a clue. So then he said, of course, well, I, I, I can only study the top 15 sort of insurance companies. I said, we are in the top 15 insurance companies. But he was, they were all obsessed with banks. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, let's go back to a bit of... <laughs> the other gossip you want to... Mark Carney, I, I, when he arrived in England and started saying that he, um, he was going to make us all very frightened and he was going to regulate us ferociously and he put insurance and banks in the same speech, I wrote to him saying, will you please realise the general insurance industry has behaved immaculately I guess you say there's all the regulators. We went through all that 2007-8 crisis where banks made instruments for us to buy. They were yielding 4% AAA rated bonds. And we didn't, we turned them all down because we actually do risk analysis for a living. It's what an underwriter does. He's a risk analyst. And so we didn't um, buy any of those things. But you're now treating us and talking to us as though we were, as had John Tyner before him. But I said... Um, you know, wake up, so, you know, just treat us with some respect because we have not had an insurance go bust, I don't think, since an um, independent insurance company. Is that right? And everybody knew that was going to go bust except for the regulator. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, he, uh, I waited for an answer to this and three weeks later I got my secretary, the only way to get a senior man to write is go to the PA and ask the PA to ask the PA the PA I said, well, he's having a letter drafted. Now, why didn't he just pick up the telephone? Because I was in those days the grand old man of insurance. Why didn't he think, oh, it would be interesting to talk to him about the insurance market? But no, in his bubble, you know, in his elite bubble, well, it's, it's, it's amazing. But anyway, there we go. But uh, this, what have I got to do now? Go back a bit of history? No. 
I did join Syndicate 33 in September 65. You said 65, just when Betsy was blowing. It was a hurricane that went through and caused absolute devastation because we all insured in those days in, in silos, and it did rigs, it did platforms, it did onshore, offshore, went out and then went onshore again, and it did every single class of business possibly had a... And I think it was after that that they rented generals, where we all had one insurance company. Uh, but it, uh, one insurance contract covering all our activities. And, uh, but I, it is wonderful to start right at the bottom. Uh, where, you know, small syndicate, lost money for five years, then Betsy. There's only one way to go. There is. It's up, ever onwards and upwards. <laughs> uh, but in the 60s, we did very much depend on MGAs. I mean, we were just... Ten of us, you know, some of them in the office, and we, we sat there and we, we wrote big risks which came to Lloyd's around the world, and we got MGAs mostly in America and brokers' covers to write business for us. And I wasn't going to give the power of the pen to anybody I didn't respect, so I went to America, and because um, I liked the retail side, I've always liked lots of little, and I can control as opposed to writing great big drop-down cascade treaties that comes and goes. And I did at the box do, do the retail side very early. And I always just say, I make all the money and you make all the noise the other end because it's... it's um, anyway, I went to America and I, I would only give an MGA a power of the pen if I would employ him. I can't employ him, he's over there, and I can't employ him any more people anyway. And it, it's as simple as that. And, and we built a very good business. And it seemed to me ridiculous to try and write local business in America. Um, from England, which, of course, underwriters were doing. I did spend a year before joining the box as a, as a broker going around Lloyd's, showing them funny little... It was called crap in those days. Nowadays, you have to call it... Um, you wouldn't be allowed to call it crap, but it was, it was, it was absolute rubbish business. And it, Anyway... I, another thing I, I want to comment on is it, what strikes me is, as a lover of the retail side and the small and the and the e and and the stuff we do, uh, which in fact has very big value because at Hiscox, the share price is completely um, propped up by the fact that it has, can make, last year made 100 million out of retail business, which is controllable, it's ours, a lot of it's direct, and the other side didn't make any money, um, writing these big risks from around the world. So there's, there's real value in it, as it can make more money every year if you choose, choose the right MGA and choose the right risk yourself. Um, it's valued much higher PE than uh, the up and down other stuff. But it's always struck me as odd that reinsurance underwriters are so highly paid and retail underwriters aren't. Household business is deemed to be ordinary and dull stuff for little people to do. And, big hero underwriters sit at the box and get paid a million a year to do it. And actually, underwriting reinsurance is dead easy. These days, these days when they have a heat map and the thing comes in, they put a disc in and they tell exactly how much they've got in Florida and things. And uh, it's all, that is really simple bookmaking. You've got so much money and you're getting rate online and it's pure, simple bookmaking. And you can count your, these days, you can count your aggregates and you know what you've got. You know how much you could lose. I must say... When, when I started in Lloyd's and, and there was nobody knew what they had. Uh, I mean, we had a computer, one of those wonderful IBM jobs with uh, cards, you know, which my job, the first job at the box, this is my, my occupation, was to go through all the cards, making sure they got the reference right on the premium cards that came through from the computer. We added up the premiums, but we had no idea what the liabilities were. None whatsoever. I think we got enough, don't you think we got enough in Florida? And they'd say, yeah, I think we have now. So it, it, it meant that so many people went out of business and Lloyd's didn't really matter because before the liability problems came along, Syndicate went out of business because Jared had a go and failed and he was taken over by Jack. And, but um, it got very sticky in the end when the pollution and liabilities came along. But, um, what else have I got to say here? God, well, I, I, I don't, you don't hear any of that. And, uh, my first experience of, of regulation when Lloyd's got some, actually, in, in the 80s, was when um, there were a lot of losses made on brokers' binders, and binders became a bad word. And so they, uh, if you were going to have a facility with a 
bureaucrat, I remember with a MGA or a broker, you had to uh, get it regulated. You had to get permission from a Lloyd's department. And I'd go to America, I'd meet somebody I really liked. I wanted to give them the power of the pen. Love paying them on um, profit commission, because I think profit commission is a real galvanizer for them to underwrite well. Uh, and you come back and you'd get uh, some bureau and lawyers wanting to know this and to fill, fill in a box. You know, I thought this is absurd. They're trying to second guess me and what I've chosen. But those, that's tame compared to what happens today. And if you join Lloyds, given there were a lot of underwriters who didn't leave their boxes, didn't choose people well, and were losing quite a lot of money regularly. Um, if you're in Lloyds, you're in a convoy, and you have to, we all know that convoys go as slow as the slowest member. And um, I wrote here, like the EU. <laughs> but I promise I went. I used to, for 20 years before the referendum, I never ever made a speech without having a bash at the EU. Um, but it's been such a wonderful result to be so mashed up by politicians. It's just been so depressing. So I'll try and keep off the subject. But Lloyd's is very like the EU because Lloyd's, when it was a loose federation of syndicates who could do what they like and run themselves and with no regulation except for a word from the chair, was bound to fail. And it did. And I had to help pick up the pieces. Lloyd's with cent strong central governance and whoever the current chap is, Hancock, tells you you can't write this, and you can't do this, and you can't do it. With very strong governance and cohesion, it's done very well. And we set that regulation in ourselves. But um, anyway, we got our capital when we started. We were a, a managing agent. Why do you call yourselves managing general agents? We were a Lloyd's managing agent, and we got our capital from members of Lloyd's. And when I, when I came to Lloyd's in 64 and joined the syndicate in 65, members of Lloyd's had to show £75,000, which was, in fact, a million and a half. I've looked it up today's money. But they also deemed to be people with other assets. And um, they were quite shrewd people. And then the Council of Lloyd's, in its utter naivety, or committee it was in those days, naively thought, and I watched them do it, that lots of little names would be better than big ones because they were short of capital at the time and people, shrewd names weren't joining. And uh, I would say that rich people are shrewd or are well advised because it's much more difficult to keep money than to make it. And um, we went down to having a reduced entry fee of £37,500 to be a mini member of Lloyd's. And it, it, you know, the death knell of Lloyd's was sounded, I'm afraid, because we had such innocent capital. And, uh, you know, capitalise the mortgage on a Fulham flat. Because uh, you could show assets, you know. You didn't have to put that amount of money in even. You 37,500 was just assets. And uh, they couldn't afford to lose money. Um, they didn't know how to choose a good agent. They didn't have the wit to choose me. And they'd choose... I used to watch them. They were once called by the Daily Mail, lambs to the slaughter. And I used to see them being walked around Lloyd's, being sh shown by an agent who was a very good lunchtime agent, who was a member of White's probably, to a syndicate that you knew was toxic. And I thought, this person is exposing everything they've got. And I absolutely hated unlimited liability. And when I, when I came to Hiscox, I, 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 and the reason we, we got quite a lot of names came to us is I used to say to every name that came in, don't ever, rule number one of the Harvard Business School, is don't incur unlimited liability. And I just made that up, but nobody's ever contradicted me. Really. <laughs> it's number one rule, sensible rule of life. And number two, I'd say, I would never be a member of Lloyd's if I didn't work here. And I'll only put you on syndicates I want to join myself. So that was a wonderful soft sell, but fortunately we didn't lose the money. And the worst agents, you know, who promised the most get rich quick. Um, did terrible damage, and that, that was the worst. You, you said it was a very unpleasant time, really, because a lot of people were very badly hurt. And uh, the crisis did come, and I, having been an absolutely long-term critic of the Committee of Lloyds, used to write an annual letter to the Committee of Lloyds telling them how badly they were running it. <laughs> Stephen Merritt once says they, 
the, the, the committee of lawyers waits for Robert Hiscox's annual letter like a first night at the theatre waiting for the critics the next morning or something but it was such fun but then they said uh, I had to join them in 93 because you know, David Rowland was chairman and he's a sensible fellow and uh, so I joined as his deputy and it was a most grim time because people were having such a grim time we always knew ahead of the event how bad it was and uh, I'd hated it was as I said unlimited liability so when he said to me Robert we need capital because in July of 1993 Lloyd's capital had gone from 10 billion to 5 billion from the resignations of names they were just running for the door you put Lloyd's into meltdown into runoff and it would be phenomenally expensive because you know you've got 300 years of underwriting to catch up with you and no premiums to pay for it so I, I set up a little working party of me and um, I got in uh, a brilliant chap called uh, Richard Johnson who should have got the Lloyd's Guild medal not me J.P. Morgan because I used to go to lunch and he really has studied Lloyd's and Barry O'Brien from Freshfields who did get a silver medal and those two are the best brains I could have and we did invent a way of joining Lloyd's with capital which was not unlimited and uh, still 25 years later 19, 2018 we still have unlimited members some of them left there because um, I know you can't really be blamed on David Rowland he did on the way out promise them that they could go on and join themselves but um, I remember Jeremy Morse do you remember Sir Jeremy Morse who was chairman of Lloyd's Bank he turned to Robert outgoing chairman of very dangerous people <laughs> because you start promising things but um, 25 years later we've still got this mixed bag of people backing Lloyd's we've got Scottish limited partnerships unlimited but we've got this and it, it's expensive because instead of just having a shareholder who doesn't require any um, regulatory protection we've got big investor protection I don't know how many floors of Lloyd's are used up with protecting those names from themselves and, um, you know, Lloyd's is 25 years after, well, I left it 23 years ago, the centre of Lloyd's, absolutely still a very high-cost enterprise. When I started underwriting, it was incredibly cheap. We, we wrote business at 85% of tariff rates. Tariff companies write, we write not 15% off because we've got 15% less expenses, at least. Uh, worst... Uh, statistic in the task force which we did in 1991 was that Lloyd's pays more commission than any other insurer and brokers make less money doing business with it and I wouldn't be sure if it wasn't the same still today because the, 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 the executive of Lloyd's who are paid a bloody fortune are there any in the room today? I, mean, <laughs> um, I was once making a speech to a large conference and I, and I, and I pretended I just picked up the Lloyd's accounts and I opened it up and I Good Lord, the salaries, I said. Good Lord, Richard Wall's paid a million and a half quid a year. Jesus. He's running a 60 million turnover building, because, you know. But um, they've all been incredibly highly paid. And they should have got a real grip of the market and made it electronic, you know, excellent. And it hasn't really happened, has it? But anyway, getting corporate capital in was absolutely wonderful. But uh, I couldn't manipulate the rules entirely as I wanted because uh, to start with it followed the uh, Lloyd's rule as if you worked in Lloyd's you weren't allowed to work in, in, in the insurance any other insurance underwriting enterprise and uh, I said this is madness we want to have insurers I mean you general agents have insurers backing you Do, does anybody here have actually innocent capital shoemakers and people backing them in their MGAs no because you're passing the risk on aren't you so, anyway <coughs> We, um, anyway, we, we weren't allowed to have insurers, and I thought that was mad, because I thought they're the most sophisticated capital you can have. They know what you're doing. And no, no, we had to rely on it. But they did form these very clever um, investment trusts to invest in Lloyd's. But uh, the, the next year, I quietly put forward for membership of Lloyd's uh, for, to be an investor, a building society, uh, which I knew had underwriting in it. And once they let it in, I'm quite tricky sometimes, I said, well, now we've got them, we, we, and it was unleashed. Because I knew by 1994 5 that I had to build a business outside Lloyd's as well as sticking it. I mean, Lloyd's is fine. I don't know quite what it's doing at the moment. It's, it's, um, 
I mean, the minute it got to make money again in 96 or 7, it, it, Cox Barrow got stern on the branch, you know, he got all cocky again, and they, I knew they weren't going to change. And it has done very well for 20 years. Uh, but where's it going? If this was a future of Lloyd's conference, I'd have quite a lot to say. It, um, anyway, what else have I got to say? I think I'm about finished now, am I? Um, <clears throat> What we do need is a new task force. We really do need a new task force. Now I've got to get on MGAs now. I'll tell you, there's something I hear about MGAs. You're the devil incarnate, aren't you? <laughs> it's quite funny, because when we, when we finish at Lloyd's and got this, um, we've been through you know, the most dramatic crisis of Lloyd's possible. We owed millions, and it cost those of us in the market a lot of... Um, health and money to keep it going. And then all they wanted to do, the hierarchy of Lloyd's, was to get lots and lots more underwriters in. And they gave it away. I said, don't, don't, don't give it away. Sell a seat at Lloyd's. I, I turned to Bob Clements, who ran Marshmack Risk Capital. Would you pay $5 million to start a syndicate in Lloyd's? He said, of course I would. Because you get instant value. I, I don't believe the seven thousand. I mean, our Hiscox London market has 30 to 35 percent of its business from MGAs, so we obviously believe in it and use them. And they, they're on the old Lloyd's model. As I sit at the box and I write big risks, and I get, I do the little risks. As long as it doesn't compete with Hiscox Insurance Company, which is writing business direct and everything. Um, but, but you have to wonder, you know, if insurance underwriting is our core product and we, you know, underwriting is our core activity. Why do we delegate it out so easily? And I get told because you lot can easily set one up and you haven't got the regulation, you haven't got to get the capital, you can be fleet of foot and bright and versatile, but why can't we? I mean, when I first had lunch, with, we, we, I found we had signed up to be underwritten for by a major insurance, uh, MGA, the biggest, I think, in the UK. And the proprietor, David, <laughs> I was having, having dinner with him, and, and I said, well, why are we using you? And why, why, this is what we do for a living. Why are we using you to underwrite for us? He said, well, we do what you can't do, Robert. I said, well, what's that? Well, we can go into Italy, for instance, and give 25% action to somebody and set them up. I said, well, we can give, public companies can give action to people. Uh, probably easier to do it than, than private companies. Oh, we go to places you wouldn't want to go to, like Italy and Australia. I'm thinking, no, we don't want to go there because we know what the markets are like. But <laughs> yeah, there, there is a habit of underwriters to go and do what they'd never do sitting for themselves. But at the same time, I, I, I can see that, um, you know, the, the smaller people in Lloyd's and smaller players and, and, and lazy insurers, it is better to have it done for them by specialists. And uh, that agency, Haggerty, in, in America, who does old collectible cars only, is admirable. I've been there. They know everything about this. I wouldn't possibly try and compete with them. They'll do a better job than I could ever do. 
But, um, and as I said, having been a tiny player in Lloyd's, it would be churlish of me to try and stop them using you. Um, although sometimes, you must admit, you do undermine the market a bit. A little bit of undermining the discipline. So, um, I'm going to finish up now, really. Don't you think I've done enough? I mean, I... <laughs> God, well, Do you want that? Um, there are, yes. Well, can I just finish by saying that the, the sun is very much shining for you in the 7,000 you think you are and the 300 you may be. <laughs> but, that's a typical MGA, you see. Um, but the, um, what was I going to say? The, the multiples you're being bought for. By the time you sold again, isn't it, Charles? I mean... <laughs> The multiples are phenomenal, so I, I would say the sun is shining very much in your area at the moment, and, and it is, has looked a bit bubbly to me, and um, if I were an MJ, would I stay doing what I'm doing, or would I succumb to a takeover? Since I never have succumbed to a takeover, I probably would stay doing what you're doing, but it is looking quite bubbly at the moment, is it not, or not? Anyway... <laughs> It's cyclical insurance, all I know is in my time I've seen MGAs hated and I've seen MGAs loved. And um, there was a time when I first came to the market, they wrote a lot of liability business, Donald Fox and people, they were all far too young to remember, but there was some, some really seriously damaging underwriting done um, by people underwriting, as there was in Lloyd's too. But um, then you've made me a lot of money in certain places and lost me money, so... I come out absolutely level. I love you and hate you. Thank you. Um, Robert, there's a question here that it's, it's a little cheeky one, actually. Um, are you coming out of retirement to place Inga Beal, a CEO of Lloyd's? If not you, who would you like to see in the role? I really don't know, because I'm, I'm so out of it. I don't, you're all so young now. I haven't got a clue. But um, I know I leave that up to Bruce Carnegie Brown to find a... And the chief executive. I, I was asked to be chairman, Lloyd's, following David Rowland, but I, I said, no, David, I'm enjoying myself at Hiscox. Why on earth would I go on the rubber chicken circuit as chairman Lloyd's? <laughs> I, I loved El Jeremy. He said, well, well, within the banking, we all rather want to be on the sort of banking council. I said, well, not here in Lloyd's. All right. <laughs> Another question here, in fact, is, and you spoke quite a bit about regulation, if current regulations had been in place prior to 1992, would reconstruction and renewal have been necessary for Lloyds? And perhaps regs are a necessary evil. That must be a regulator speaking, isn't it? <laughs> we do have one in the audience. <laughs> I don't think so. I don't know. I, I, yes, I, uh, undoubtedly, when I was young, without regulation, a lot of people lost a lot of money and it didn't really matter until that 91 to what really mattered then was the, 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 the liability business got to be cripplingly expensive. And um, that's something nobody had forecast. Yes, I, I, I am actually the worst person to talk here because I set in regulation and I want to... I think if you're going to be in Lloyd's, I want Lloyd's regulated as tightly as a something-something, I can't say in public. I really do because it's a mutual market. And... Uh, you know, if one, I had to pay during the crisis. I once worked out how much money I put in in levies and, and, and paying other people's losses. It's phenomenal. So if you're going to sit down and write, I hate mutuality because I hate it. I, I, I decline it, you write it, and I pay. So I want Lloyd's unwrited, uh, really. So Lloyd's is doing a, has done a bloody good job in regulating, and there have not been, you know, any overt losses we've heard about. I mean, of course, syndicates are losing money. But it, it, it's what comes on top of that from the regulator. I mean, the, the, you know, all the how to do in treating customers fairly and in our insurance company world, you know, it, it's a non-stop bureaucratic interference in how you do business with no judgment on, on you and what you're like. Or, and uh, you must all agree with me. I mean, in, in life, regulation now, in England, we love it. You know, we take the insurance intermediary bill from Brussels, which was 19 pages, and we make it 70. I hear boasts from government, the world, all the regulators, that don't worry, you know, post-Brexit, well, we'll go on gold-plating everything. And they think the gold-plated regulator... Yes, I don't want any insurance company to go bust. So if I want the underwriting 
And I don't think you should underwrite things without a proper business plan. And all of you should be regulated so that you can't, you know. You, but it, they do it in form. I'm trying to put words. I can't. They do it in how you do it. And, and, and if you don't write a risk, but you, you, if you said you were going to do it and you don't do it or because it wasn't the right thing to do, you get punished for not doing it, whereas you didn't do it because it was the wrong thing to do. But you've got to have all this form all the time. And you know how much money you all spend, we do, in insurance companies, spend a fortune on regulation. And most of it is mindless. We have a voting system here on a number of the questions. And one here, it's a little political, has reached uh, the top marks. Um, and it, it mentions the Vote Leave Brexit campaign and what effect do you think leaving the EU will have on the insurance industry and specifically MGAs? Well, I, I heard that you write 5 billion in the UK, so that doesn't affect you at all, and 250 million or something in Europe, and that might affect you if you don't have a, a residence there. But as I was brought up, you know, underwriting all around the world. I think there is a bigger world than just the EU. I find, uh, well, America was two-thirds of Lloyd's business anyway, so we've, we've had to put up with appalling regulation. Not appalling, but you've got to get permission in each state. It's very hard to... They make it deliberately really hard and protectionist in America, and we, we manage handsomely. So anybody with a wit and wisdom can get, get round whatever they produce. But um, I, I... I mean, the EU, I just find is a democratic deficit, really. Do, would any of you who are running, I say, who are living in a good family, merge your families with 27 other families, most of which are dysfunctional? No, no, I wouldn't do that. They say. So would you merge your businesses? Your, those of you who are happy in your business, would you merge it with 27 other, most of which are losing money, and take your orders from Croydon? Because <laughs> we, don't, we take our order, not from the, we don't take it from government out there, we take it from the Council of Ministers. And I torture people, I ask them, how do you know how a rule's made in Europe? They don't. And it's made by the Council of Ministers. There are no other rules. You know, so we're, 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 we're obeying rules bought by bureaucrats. And it's, at least in England, if we have an incompetent prime minister, we can get rid of them once every five years or earlier. But, uh, and also trade. I, I love it when I said, why is George Soros to somebody the other day so keen on us remaining in? And they said, well, he's an internationalist. I said, so I see if you stick to Europe and you get told what to do, my mummy Merkel, and you're a thing of 27, then, then it really, you know, that's really... So I thought there's a world out there, America, Canada, Australia. I mean, there's a world. Internationalist is not being in the EU, stuck in the EU, only able to do what the EU does. But uh, I could go on forever. Don't, don't, don't get me going. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. The final question, just to um, finish off the uh, um, speeches, what are you most proud of in your career? <laughs> in my career? I'm proudest in my life. I have your five, life. five children who like each other and seem to quite like me. In my career, I, I think we were a very human company. And I thought we really cared about humans, not in the cloud. I think if you run a company where you care for each other and, you, and that shows through to the customer. I was very proud recently when Andrew Sellers, in, I got sent an article from Link where he is a prominent member of the LGDPQ community. <coughs> and um, 20 years ago he went to join his cops and for six months stayed in the closet, as he puts it, and he really was, it was a nightmare of a time, he said. And then he came out, and nobody cared. He said, nobody cared at all. It's just a non-issue. And I would always run a company. I don't care where you, People think it's because I speak in a lardy dar accent that I only like dukes and things. But <laughs> I, I once said to HR, I said, how many Etonians? Eton's the best school in the world. I said, how many Etonians have we employed? You know, Alec Foster and Charles Duplin, two in 30 years. Well, it's quite wrong. You're obviously choosing the wrong people. But I, <laughs> I never cared where anybody came from, what they did in their personal life, as long as they do a good job. And I think we, we built a decent company. And I never did any harm to anybody. There were certain underwriters, but I joined. I saw people like Posgate who, who could um, underwrite very, very well indeed, but they could at the expense of other people. By God, there are some underwriters who can lay it off and, and screw their reinsurers. And I thought, you either go through life screwing other people and making money, which all investment bankers do, or you make money and a lot of other people money with you. And I'm not 
overtly, I'm not aware, somebody can come out of the audience and tell me that we ever screwed anybody, we just tried to do a decent job and we paid a lot of claims. And it was bloody good fun. <laughs> Why do people think insurance is boring? I don't know. And that's very good to know, okay. uh, uh, note to end on. On behalf of us all, thank you very much um, for a wonderful... <laughs>